Well, this morning I'm, I'm really going, so a lot of today we're, we're really focusing more on hearing from actual water providers. Um, so this talk is a little bit of a divergence from that. Um, and I'm going to be talking about from the perspective of an organization like Western Water Assessment, how we go about making climate information more usable. That's going to be the first part of this talk. And the second part of the talk will be um, diving into some research that our director, Lisa Dilling, and Rebecca Page worked on uh, last year to uh, understand how and what kind of climate information water providers on the western slope of Colorado are using. Um, so first, I'm going to, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we go about making climate information more useful. Um, and then talk about kind of what that next step is, um, meaning that as scientists, as information providers, we can sort of do the work to make the information usable, but there's really another step that's needed, and that has to do with actual, actually working with potential users of that climate information. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about um, this research that um, we've worked on trying to understand um, what kind of climate information uh, water providers are using. So in, in talking about how to make climate information more usable, I'm going to talk about, kind of break this down into four parts. One, scale. Is this climate information locally relevant? What's the skill of this information? Is the information understandable? And finally, talk just a little bit about the concept of co-production, meaning um, organizations like ourselves working actively with end users of climate information to develop that climate information or research to make to ensure that it's highly useful. Um, so first, just talking about scale, I, I'm really talking about geographical scale. And I'm going to use uh, global climate models as a great example of this. This is a map of uh, Salt Lake Valley in Utah. And, and climate and drought inform climate information really needs to be at that appropriate scale. Um, so, for example, global climate models typically have grid cells of 60 by 80 miles. Um, in the mountainous west, this is not maybe that useful of a scale. Here in Salt Lake Valley, um, that incorporates parts of the Wasatch Mountains, the Ochre Mountains, the Great Salt Lake, Salt Lake County, and Utah County. So, on the scale of an individual water provider, climate information of this sort is not useful. So we use downscale climate information, where we take that large grid cell, uh, use statistical methods to give information on uh, a four by four mile grid cell, where we can give information about climate in Salt Lake Valley at 4,000 feet and up in the mountains at 9,000 feet. So that scale is very important. Um, the skill of the climate information is also uh, of great importance. Um, we can have the scale right, but if it's bad climate information. If we're not, if say it's forecast information, a good example would be the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center stream flow forecasts. If those were bad stream flow forecasts, which they're not, they're very good stream flow forecasts, people wouldn't keep coming back to use those. So the skill of a given forecast or climate information is very important. And having consistency in that skill is also important to uh, ensure that users trust that information. It's also very important that that information is understandable. And, and that is something as, as scientists working in this space between research science and end users of that science that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, it's very important that there's not information sort of lost in translation between that research science community and the end user community. So we spend a lot of time making sure climate information in whatever form it is, is understandable to the end user. And, and finally, when, when we, Western Water Assessment and organizations like ours, work to develop climate information, a resource, a workshop, research, we really strive to co-produce that, that work as much as possible. And what I mean by that is working directly with an end user or the end user of that information to ensure the work that we're doing is tailored towards 
the needs of that end user. And that's a really important step that sometimes in the research science community is not given, not as much time is given to that, but that's really kind of where our organization and organizations like ours are specifically tailored and we, we budget a lot of time and work that we do to be able to co-produce information to work with end users. Um, so I, I, I want to bring sort of a, a, a movie cliche into this. As I was uh, creating this presentation, it you know popped into my mind, uh, you know, the Kevin Costner movie, a, a Field of Dreams, and the classic quote from that: "If you build it, they will come." And and why I bring that up is as as developers of climate information and, and research science, sometimes it's easy to fall into that, oh, I have this great idea. I'm just gonna do this and it's gonna be super useful to everybody. Well, the reality is, is that if you just, as a scientist, build something really useful, it's not necessarily going to be useful. You need to work with those end users of that climate information to make sure that it's usable. Um, so, you know, we really strive to not fall into that trap of having these great ideas and we're just going to create this thing and I think it's going to be super usable. We, we really spend a lot of time, you know, ensuring that that is usable through interactions with stakeholders and, and end users. So I, I want to finish this brief talk um, talking a little bit about uh, some research that Western Water Assessment uh, did. This is work done by Lisa Dilling and Rebecca Page over the last couple years. Um, you know, some of the work that we do is kind of on the social science side of things, of, of understanding um, sort of how and why and under what conditions uh, users use certain kinds of climate information. So um, they worked on a study, uh, it was a comparative case study of five small to medium sized water providers on the western slope of Colorado uh, to better understand their decision contexts and climate information uses. Uh, a major goal of this research was to build theoretical knowledge about how to advance drought information in rural mountainous snowmelt driven regions. So that's a rather specific goal but it's pretty applicable to a lot of our region. That, that describes much of our region. Um, and in this uh, study, uh, our group worked with two municipalities and three water conservancy districts of varying sizes. Um, they, they had, a, you know, they supplied water um, ranging from 2,000 acre feet to 110,000 acre feet per year. Um, so this is kind of, uh, I want to talk a little bit about going beyond just this sort of usability of climate information. So a water provider might see information as useful, but how is that information actually then adopted into the work that they're doing, either long-term planning or short-term operations? And, and whether that information is usable or not is only one factor that goes into actually leading to the adoption of that information being used. And some of those other factors include organizational factors, just what's the size of the organization? How is that organization structured? Is there someone dedicated to um, sort of looking at, at planning um, and the size of an organization you know, really is dependent on that? Um, how that information is disseminated? What I mean by that is where is that information coming from? Is it coming from what the organization considers a trusted source or is it a complete unknown? For example, organizations like USGS or NOAA or CBRFC by these small water providers are considered trusted sources. Um, also this concept of communities of practice. And what I mean by that is, you know, how are organizations getting their information? Um, how, how are they structured to look outside of themselves to get some of this organization? And finally, the concept of peer learning. Are they learning from other organizations like themselves. Um, and, and finally, I just want to talk, go just dive briefly into a little more depth about some of those factors. Some of the organizational factors that are important in the adoption of climate information for these uh, you know, small water providers on the west slope of Colorado include their capacity, their size, their experience with drought and climate information, and generational turnover uh, plays a big role too. 
Um, you know, sometimes as if, if there's some younger uh, staff coming in, they might have new ideas about different sorts of climate information to use and don't necessarily, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people have been doing this for decades, just have a certain way of doing things and that works for them and they keep doing that. Um, and then finally, uh, a little bit about information dissemination. Um, what are trusted providers? And as I mentioned, some trusted providers for this group of water providers include NOAA, NRCS, USGS. What's the credibility of those information sources? Um, how is that information disseminated? Is it, is it, are they getting that information through some of their trusted networks? Um, is this information used by another water manager? There was a tendency for a water manager to look more favorably on a new climate information source if another water provider they knew and talked to was using this source and had success with it. And finally, has that product been tested? Um, so those are just uh, some lessons that we learned about um, how climate information is adopted uh, by a small subset of water providers on the western slope of Colorado. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions.